Hello everybody, uh, my name is Mihai Karabash and today I'm going to present to you an uh, implementation of a virtual generative lab controller on the BSD hypervisor, Beehive. This is basically a continuation of my work and my students for Beehive RMD7. So last year I was here presenting you Beehive RMD7 and it was booting until getting the interrupt controller like the current status of the RMD8, I explained it earlier. Uh, further, we managed to finalize the implementation of the virtualization for the interrupt controller and also for timer. Right now, we have you'll see that we have a guest that, that is booting and it gets to the console. First of all, some words about us. Uh, I'm a senior professor at the University of Politica of Bucharest. Um, I'm also a teaching assistant in the domain of operating systems, system architectures, and also networks. Uh, regarding the BSD world, I start working coding on uh, BSD, on robot type BSD at the Google Sum of Code project, two years in a row. Uh, first I worked on the schedule and then implementing a virtualization, actually memory virtualization for their kernels. From 2014, uh, I've started working on Beehive, different projects. The most important one is Beehive on ARM. I worked on it two years in a row, one in Google, Google Sum of Code and one on my own, until 2016. Uh, unfortunately, from 2016, I didn't have, so last year I didn't have so much time to code. I only coordinate uh, different students in different areas regarding Beehive. Uh, so, actually, the entire virtualization part was started by me, uh, half of the code was written by me, and the other half was written by a former master student of mine, uh, Nikolai Alex Ivan, uh, which finished his master, who finished his, his master, and right now it's employed in the industry. But it's helping me, you will see that he's helping me in reviewing the patches and uh, submit them to upstream. Uh, let's start with the motivation. Why do we need interrupts at all? So, this is a basic question. Um, I don't know how many of you have put the, this question in time. But basically, it, it is because we don't want polling. So whenever we want to transfer something from a device, we have two options, polling, so waiting for the device to give out the information. But in many times, the device is slower, much, much, much more slower than the CPU. So basically, we blow the CPU uh, with no reason. Or we have the... Um, uh, event-based interruption part, so basically each device will notify the CPU whenever it has some information for, uh, for him. And this is where the data control comes in, uh, in play. So basically it's a new device and it's basically an interface, an, um, an abstraction between the uh, peripheral devices and the CPU. Uh, the devices are registered to interrupt the interrupt controller and also the interrupt controller for the, the, those interrupts as events to the CPU. Uh, so to summarize, the interrupt control is a connector between the CPU and the devices which take care of notifying whenever a uh, different type of data is available. Uh, let's see back to the interrupt controllers. We, uh, every a lot of you have heard about the advanced programmable interrupt controller, the API, from XCD6. It is basically architecture dependent and it implemented on AMD and Intel also. On ARM, we have another interrupt controller called Generic Interrupt Controller, GIC, you will see everywhere, and it's specific to ARM. These two has very different um, design logics in, in the back. And I will insist on the generic interrupt controller today. Uh, the generic interrupt controller is uh, a system presenting all ARM processors, almost all ARM processors. Uh, it centralizes the, uh, the interrupt support and management. Basically, all the interrupts are coming to, 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 to this JIC and they are forwarded to the specific course of a, of a platform. Uh, on a basis on how it was configured. 
uh, it provides a set of registers to enable management of data of sources and the behavior. Basically, we have, you have these different memory mapped zones where you can configure the uh, generic interrupt controller, deliver interrupts, and also we have other memory mapped zones which are called CPU, interface, CPU interfaces, you will see it later, where basically the cores, uh, the cores of the platform are acknowledging that those interrupts. Uh, when, generally speaking, the interrupt controller may provide support for the following, the security extensions. The security extensions are basically another level of privilege, different from the hypervisor one, the kernel one, uh, which is available on some of the platforms, where you can write secure code, which is, cannot be accessible from neither of all other uh, privileges. Basically, the security extensions are the most privileged level in a CPU. And you need interrupts, you need exceptions to get there. Uh, virtualization, virtualization extensions, you will see later that we are using the interrupt controller to switch between virtualization extensions and the kernel mode, the host. Um, so to generate interrupts, we can generate interrupts from our code. This is especially useful, for example, in um, emulating devices. So on the Vertio, when we want to generate an interrupt from the host to the guest, we can use such kind of SGIs. They are called also SGIs. Um, managing and generating interrupts from hardware sources. So other sources will be the, the, the hardware ones with a few devices to deliver interrupts to the CPU. Also about interrupt masking and prioritization. Very important here. Interrupt masking means that uh, we basically block interrupts coming to the CPU. Whenever we are executing some uh, kind of codes, we need this option. And most of all, another important thing is prioritization. We, we need to prioritize, prioritize uh, some kind of interrupts, like time interrupts, instead of, uh, for example, other slower devices. Uh, it's very important in the well-functioning of the system, this one. And here, the problem that appear in this priority stuff is very hard to debug. When we have, for example, multiple guests or guests with multiple cores, you see that the, the guest behaves very worse, but the host is okay. Uh, this could be about uh, how we are delivering the trash to the guest. Uh, and also, it provides support for multiprocessor and multiprocessor events. So it's able to redirect, redirect these events to one or more cores, depending on how it was configured. So these are basically the, the main uh, features that are provided by the genetic interrupt controller. Uh, the genetic interrupt controller is formed of two important pieces. The distributor, it basically aggregates all the interrupts uh, and also distributes them to different CPUs. The interrupts are distributed to the CPUs to the CPU interfaces. Basically, we have a CPU interface for each core on the Elonian platform. Each of these are basically some registers that are memory mapped. Okay? The distributor is controlled, is controlled by the kernel, by the generic interrupt controller driver. And it basically says, OK, we have these interrupts. We enable uh, other interrupts, um, and, and so on. On the CPU interfaces, the CPU interfaces are used by the course itself to uh, acknowledge the interrupt, uh, to receive the interrupt, and so on. So we have here two entities. The CPU is controlled by the driver of the generic interrupt controller, and the CPU interfaces uh, are basically controlled with codes by the device drivers. For example, when they acknowledge something, they acknowledge on the CPU interface. Let's see some of the uh, generic interrupt control specific registers. We have, uh, first of all, you see a convention here. You have the GICD, you have the JC actually, and then you have two letters, D from the distributor and C from the CPU interface. So these are uh, registers specific to the distributors, the distributor and the, to the CPU interface. Uh, first of all, there we have the uh, 
the GICD is enabled, uh, which is the interrupt set clear enable registers. Basically, it enables forwarding of the corresponding interrupt uh, from the distributor to the CPU interface. Uh, then we have the re uh, register GICD uh, is, um, is pending. Interface uh, set clear pending registers. Basically, we set or clear the pending state of the respective interrupt. Uh, the fourth one is the active interrupt. Uh, but, so, sorry, it's the one that activates and deactivates uh, interrupt. Uh, you will see there that we are using this whenever we want to save or restore the, the JAC state. We will, I'll present you later uh, what this means and where it's using virtualization. And we have two main registers when talking about the CPU interface. is the interrupt knowledge register, uh, where it contains the interrupt ID uh, for the processor to read. Basically, we, whenever we have an interrupt, if we read this memory map register, you, you uh, will find the interrupt number that was generated for us. And the uh, end of interrupt register basically signals the completion of the interrupt. Whenever we complete the uh, interrupt handling, we write this end of interrupt uh, register. These are, uh, let's say, some main important registers. There are a lot of, a lot of, a lot more of them when talking about uh, the interrupt controller. Uh, right now, I want you to, pa uh, to pass you to the interrupt lifecycle. It's very important for us to understand which are, uh, what are the states and what are the transitions between each state of an interrupt. Uh, this was useful in order to uh, to genuinely uh, emulate the distributor when talking about uh, interrupt, interrupt control virtualization. Because each of these states has to be replicated in the hypervisor. We have the transitions one and two. So we have transitions from inactive to pending or from active to pending and active. The interrupt becomes, becomes uh, pending due to um, due to being generated by the peripheral software. Okay, so some, or, or, or we have an SGI or a hardware that generates the interrupt. Pending means that it's waiting to be uh, treated. We have transition three and four from pending to inactive. Okay, from pending to inactive and from also pending uh, to active. The pending state is removed either because the interrupt was deasserted in case it's a level triggered or this is software modifying the state. We have a transition 5. Uh, transition 5 applies from pending to active, applies to edge trigger interrupts upon acknowledgement. Sorry. So when we have uh, edge trigger interrupts, when we acknowledge they are going from pending to active. Uh, transition five, transition five from pending to pending and active is for level trigger interrupts. And eight uh, and seven and eight, uh, seven from active to inactive, and eight from pending and active to pending is for software deactivated interrupts. So all of these states had to be uh, replicated in how we emulate the distributor in the virtualization of the interrupt controller inside the hypervisor. Because we had a lot of issues in proper functioning, and until we didn't follow the schema, we didn't manage to have a working uh, interrupt controller, delivering interrupts. Um, at this point, I want at this point I want to enter in uh, actual implementation of the interrupt control virtualization. But before this, I want to reiterate about what means hardware assistance virtualization in ARM CPUs because it's a little bit different than x86. It resembles to ARM V8 what Alex presented earlier. So on hardware assistance virtualization, we have a new privilege level. On Intel and AMD, 
uh, basically extends the current mode, kernel mode, the uh, root and non-root. Basically, the kernel runs, the same kernel runs with no modification in, with this virtualization extension. <coughs> in ARM, uh, basically a new brand level is created called heat mode. Uh, in ARMv7 is called heat mode, in ARMv8 is called EL2, so exception level 2. This is why you saw at Alex some heat structures. They were uh, get from the ARMv7 uh, port. So here you have the logical schema. Uh, you have the monitor mode. Uh, again, you see here the secure world. This is, this, this is the secure, secure extensions I was talking about. The, so this secure world with the monitor mode is the most privileged, privileged one. We didn't type this. So actually on, on a lot of boards, this secure world is deactivated upon boot time. You cannot use this if you don't have the keys which are uh, sometimes put in the hardware from the, by the vendors. Uh, okay, we are coming back and you will see that uh, other than kernel mode and user mode, a new mode was created called heat mode. This is equivalent for uh, exception level 2 in RV8, exception level 1 in RV8, and 0 in RV8. Given this approach, having a type 2 hypervisor is more difficult on ARM. What means a type 2 hypervisor? No one? Okay, a type of hypervisor is the one where you are using um, a currently implemented a kernel to uh, create a virtualization extension. Okay, you don't have to write everything from scratch. For example, at, in this point, a Beehive is using FreeBSD in order to implement the virtualization, virtualization extensions. Uh, it's using its memory management, it uses its, its um, uh, all management functions and uh, device management and so on. Basically, it, it, it wasn't implemented from scratch. On the opposite side is the type 1 hypervisor where you have to implement everything from scratch and here in the example exam. It is a very low uh, hypervisor with a few lines of code and it is running directly on the hardware. So, given the fact that we have a new privilege mode, this, that privilege mode fits exactly on, for example, Zen design. But on our side, we have a big kernel. We cannot put the kernel in that heap mode. Because we have to rewrite a significant part of the OS. In that new mode, heap mode, we don't have the same instructions available. They are different. You have to re-implement a lot of it. And even then, you can write, you cannot uh, run user, user specifications on top. You have to have a middle layer in kernel mode. Um, again, we want to type to hypervisor because we want to leverage the previous dimension mechanisms. For example, we don't want to create a new memory allocation, uh, new mem mem memory allocation stuff. Uh, we don't want to cre uh, create a new uh, page table management, the PMAP. We want to use the same that are right now in the VBS kernel. And also we do not write a full hypervisor from scratch. Uh, in order to accomplish this, we inserted a very small amount of code in heap mode. Uh, basically it's a bridge between the host OS and the heap mode. And uh, the host OS will call will call this uh, this small code base whenever it has to execute operations as a hypervisor. Uh, also, other type of implementation from KVM. KVM is also a type of hypervisor and it has support and it was implemented by virtual operating systems in, in the same way. Basically, they use a very small amount of code and they are co calling that low visor. Okay, so I told you that um, the host OS will call the, the, small, the small code in heap mode whenever it wants to execute operations uh, regarding the virtualization. How is doing this? It's doing this by executing heap instruction. The heap instruction was specially added in the platform that supports virtualizations 
and they are basically causing an, an exception uh, and are going from kennel mode to hip mode as an event. In hip mode, the code checks from where it came at exception because we don't, we don't want to allow guests to make uh, calls to, to the actual uh, hypervisor. And only the calls can come from the, from the host. Basically, the virtual machine with ID 0 will be allowed. So this is how uh, virtualization extensions were implemented for RV7 as a type of hypervisor. Further, uh, we'll go to entire virtualization. As I stated earlier, we have two components, two components, DCP dot and CPU interface. Actually, there are more CPU interfaces. The CPU interfaces equals the number of cores. ARM provides a CPU virtual interface which can be directly uh, uh, directly mapped to the VM. Uh, basically, we map the CPU interface of the guest on the CPU virtual interface offered by the hypervisor. In this way, the guest will see a normal CPU interface. So we don't have to do anything here, just do this mapping. Uh, basically, the virtual CPU <coughs> interface is a counterpart of the physical CPU interface. It provides the same functionality, the same registers, the same offsets. So this virtual CPU interface, after it's mapped on the same offset as the CPU interface in the guest, it basically offers the same uh, functionality and more important, the same offsets of the registers. It's transparent to the guest. But we need, uh, other than the CPU interface, we need a virtualized distributor. Unfortunately, um, ARM doesn't offer us anything about virtualizing the distributor, and we basically have to uh, catch accesses to it. Uh, we have to catch accesses to the distributor in order to emulate them, and basically execute uh, in the name of the guest the operation that needs to be done by the distributor. Uh, we have some uh, generic type controller virtualization specific registers. You will see here that this GIC, the same prefix, and we have a V. We had a D for the distributor, we have a C for the CPU interface, and we have a V for the virtual CPU interface. And we have the same registers, the IAR and the EOIR, the same as the CPU interface. You see they are the same, but they are they have on your another name. They are doing the same thing. Internet of knowledge registers contain the interrupted ID for the processor, and the end of interrupt register <coughs> sign on the completion of the interrupt. Further, we have the GIC H, H comes from the hypervisor. These are the registers that are used by the hypervisor to manage to, to manage the CPU virtual interface, basically. We have the list registers basically containing interrupt context information to be used by the virtual CPU interfaces. Okay, so that virtual CPU interfaces must must offer to the guest the interrupt number that needs to, to be acknowledged or to be treated. The list register is the the place where it gets <coughs> interrupt numbers. Basically, that list register, you have the, the, the number of data, and as far as I remember, the CPU work to deliver. Uh, these list registers are limited. For example, on RV7, you can add only four interrupts, in a maximum four interrupts. Okay? This means that if you have more than four interrupts pending for a guest or for, multiple, or for a guest, uh, you cannot deliver all of them in one. Uh, in one uh, turn. You have to uh, have an internal mechanism of saving all the interrupts and deliver them. And here, the most important thing is priority. I was talking earlier. You have to put there the interrupts that, are more, uh, that have a higher priority in order to be, to be faster than to the guest, and then the others. Um, other than the JCH, 
alerts to the list registers, we have the empty list register status register, uh, which, can, which can be used to identify which, register, uh, which list registers are available to deliver an interrupt. So some of them may be uh, still uh, won't be available because of a previous interrupt not delivered or they are not available from the hardware. So whenever you want to put an interrupt to the list register, you have to check the empty list register status. Basically, with these registers, you, you can create the logic of delivering an interrupt. <sighs> In order to be uh, to enable interaction between the virtual generating dark controller, um, similar to the normal one, it is required to map the memory region used by the interrupt controller for memory map I/O in the other space of the guest. Basically, we have to map the GICC, so the GIC CPU interfaces, on the GIC virtual CPU interfaces. The mapping I was, told, uh, I was telling you earlier. Additional, what will, what will we do with the uh, GIC distributor registers? Basically, we have to trap the access of these registers because the, the guest will try to configure its generating map controller distributor by accessing them the registers. We'll trap them, and we must take the appropriate action in a high property. This is called emulation. Let's see how, uh, what are the steps in doing the distributed emulation. Uh, first, we have to register distributed, distributed address ranges for the in-kernel emulation. Uh, what this means, so whenever the guest will access a distributor address, it will basically generate an exception, and this exception will end up in the hypervisor. Here, normally, the hypervisor will tell you that it is a fault and will basically drop, uh, drop off the running VM. Uh, but we, we add a hook there in the kernel, and we said to it, if these address ranges are uh, between X and Y, for example, this is a distributor. We have to do some action. We are doing this in the kernel because the interrupt controller, uh, interrupt controller is a very important uh, time sensible uh, component. Usually, all the emulation is done in user space in the Beehive process. For example, all the Vertio uh, drivers, uh, the BVM, co B uh, BVM console we are talking earlier, is done in Beehive process. Uh, for the interrupt controller, specifically, we opted to do this simulation in kernel to be more faster and have low lat latencies. This is why there is in kernel regulation. So this simulation is, that, is done in the kernel, in the FPS kernel. Uh, we created an internal structure to retain the state of the distributor for the VM. So each virtual machine has an internal state. We, what means an internal state? It means each uh, GICD register is saved specifically for a machine, a virtual machine. Also, we, configs, uh, we, we are configuring interrupts for um, basically config, sorry, we are making basically configs for each interrupt. So we have a mask of uh, interrupts enabled, active, uh, the state of them and the configurations. All the reads and writes to the distributor are handled, as I was telling you earlier. And uh, according to what I was presenting to you earlier, we need to populate the list register, uh, uh, register accordingly to the state of the distributor. Okay, in the other we have all the active interrupts that, that will be silent, uh, signaled to the CPU virtual interfaces, as I was telling you earlier. Uh, and to leverage the existing interrupt logic, we have the internal state of the virtual GIC, of a virtual GIC, sorry, virtual GIC controller of a virtual machine in memory in a structure. Whenever a guest runs, basically we have to um, restore the state of the, this GIC and save it whenever the guest terminates its running uh, time. Okay, this is all about distributor emulation. Basically, 
we catch all the access to the CD distributor. Whatever the virtual machine wants to write in the those registers, we will basically get them and save them into some structure. And whenever the guest starts running, we get this, that structure that is specific to the distributor and put it on hardware distributor. And it would act like the virtual machine actually did that, config, that, that configuration. Um, the development platform we use for Beehive ARM is uh, Fast Models from ARM, which is emulating on Cortex A15. Unfortunately, uh, you all can test this, uh, but you need um, the Fast Models uh, software, which is free for 60 days, I guess. Otherwise, you need a license. And also, we managed to run Beehive Arm on a real uh, hardware platform called QB2, QB2 from all winner A20. We are still, uh, as far as I remember, we are still having some cache problems here. So, not all the things that uh, worked on the emulator worked on uh, QB2 also. Uh, let's see what is the current status. Uh, we currently uh, finished the boot uh, and having the console. You, you see here the boot, log, the boot log of the guest, and it only was needed from the GIC, the generic interrupt controller, which is uh, initialized. Then it aligned with current find virtual interface control register. This is normal because the guest doesn't have virtual um, CPU control interfaces, only the host. And the generic interrupt control was generally created for both when we cooked it. Okay, then we have the the, the timer. Actually, it's a type that is the virtualized timer, the generic timer. And in here, you see the from bash down, uh, down there. What issues have we encountered? The host, uh, one of the most uh, let's say hard things to, to, to get to, to this was the fact, the fact that the host interrupts were not disabled before entering guest execution. And, uh, and this would arrive while the guest was running and the generic interrupt controller of the guest didn't know from where did they can. And uh, the guest was considering these interrupts spurious. And of course, the comment at the beginning was uh, mistakenly assumed that we have an incomplete uh, implementation of the virtual GIC. Uh, the last one was the differences between the emulator and the hardware platform. Some steps was not required on the emulator, so just things just worked in there, but the hardware platform didn't work. Some final thoughts. Uh, next step. <coughs> We need to merge the code. So the entire Beehive ARM code is under review on the fabricator if you want to look. Some of the prerequisites were already merged by Andrew, but right now it's a very, very big patch which uh, basically affects little Beehive x86. And I'm waiting for, um, for it to be reviewed and merged in. Also, we have the time of virtualization, which was meant for BSD Canva, but wasn't accepted, but is in there also already working. Uh, one of the features we can add is SMP support to the VNM code. Basically, we have to do the initialization process um, on each uh, physical core, and also we have to add some locks. Otherwise, all the structures uh, were built with the thought that we will have a multiple, um, a, a multiple process, uh, multiple process guests. Sorry, in the VM. Also, uh, we want to run multiple behind VMs. We can test this out for now. And it, the last but not the least, try to run Linux as a guest OS on the high bar. Here we don't. Uh, the the hardest part here. Darius to talk about this. Uh, we have implemented the web type drivers, they're right there, but the hardest part here is how we'll bootstrap Linux because uh, we are currently using a custom Beehive that we created. It works with FBSD, but we don't know what implications will bring to, um, to a Linux kernel. 
as you know, on this on the Hive XD6, they implemented the UEFI part, UEFI part, in order to be able to put and menu distribution easily. Okay, and uh, the last test we have on multiple hardware platforms. Um, the conclusions. So, uh, are we offering us a support to create a performant virtual tab controller? Uh, but it's pretty used to emulate each operation of the distributor. So the emulation of the distributor is very, very huge. We, we, we have to check for each type of register, for each type of registers, what, what was the operation, what is the current state of the controller, and apply the, the desired operation. And also we have to sync the hardware whenever uh, a guest enters and exits. This is not very hard, but the actual emulation was very tedious. And we have to be very careful in not uh, screwing up anything in there. Uh, also, it was hard to debug on the hardware platforms. We first worked on an Exynos uh, from Samsung, which was a Cortex A15, but we burned out that, that um, hardware platform. And we went to a QB2 all winner, A20, and it was very hard at the beginning to activate the virtual distribution extensions because the reboot was disabling them. And after that, uh, debugging the caches was, was also very hard because we were mistakenly putting some bits in there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions. Yep. Is our mic or? Um, the mic. Sorry. Um, so you say it's working on the QB2. Uh, this one is using uh, Geek 400. Uh, a lot of ARM V8 platforms are also using a Geek 400. Is there any reason it shouldn't work uh, on ARM V8 using the same code? Uh, it probably would, would work. So uh, basically, we edit code in the Beehive ARM to emulate this. So that emulation part part will be probably just taken from there and put it in RV8. But we also added some hooks in the JIG, in the JIG interrupt controller driver. There are a few of them. So it will basically work. But this is the uh, GIC V2 we are emulating. Uh, if the RV8 platform has the GIC V2, it works. But I guess Alex wants to move to GIC V3 because lots, lots of Platforms ha has the V3. Yeah, most of the server grade ARM V8 are using uh, yeah, GIC yeah. V3, but yeah. a lot of uh, small embedded uh, SOC like Pine64 or whatever are using uh, still using GIC uh, V2. Mm -hmm. So, so probably, probably the V2 would be a trivial to, to, to just copy the code and uh, test it. But we have some other things that we are working on. SMP, you need several things to have. For example, you need to have cache coherency, you need to have uh, atomics, and the third thing you need to have is IPIs. Uh, is there any mechanism in the GIC V2 uh, to provide virtualized IPIs for, for the guests? No, we, we didn't look at this, we didn't talk about this. Uh -huh. So we didn't talk about the APIs. Yes, you are right, but I didn't go through it. Uh, I honestly looked at the Linux code and I saw that they are doing something in there, but I'm not, I cannot offer you a technical answer to this, to the API part. Yes, we, have, we need to have all of these. Um, actually, there are, there are uh, what I am saying here, there are two different stuff. So uh, it was mistakenly understood. So we need to provide SMP support to the VNN module. This means that we can run virtualization on all CPUs of the platform. So we can run, if you run four single CPU, vCPU guests, it will run on four cores. At this point, it doesn't do this, okay? 
and this is pretty, let's say, simple to do because it doesn't have to do anything with the API in the guest and provide the SMP for the guests. So these are two different things. Okay, and the, the part with the VM model will be SMP safe, it's easier at this point. So we just need to run the installation code on each core and be, be sure that the operations we are doing on the internal structures are uh, locked. So okay, so at this point, if you run two guests, they run on CPU zero. Okay, so uh, now it's clear. So uh, just to, just to be clear, that right now the Beehive can work only in uh, if you have one CPU on the host, right? If you have two CPUs, it will work, but only on CPU zero. Or okay, CPU zero. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, please. Okay, if there are no other questions, I would like to thank you all very much. I would like to thank my students for working with me. Um, and also, I will encourage you to uh, go and test all these features because they are on our repo. If it's FreeBSD-EPB uh, on GitHub, you have there all these projects we will present today. Uh, and I encourage you to test them and also give feedback. Thank you very much.